Hello, this is Turbodog702 with a submission commentary for Parasite Eve. This is going to be the new game category. Parasite Eve, a kind of an odd RPG series. Uh, it produced three games as part of the series, Parasite Eve 1, 2, and The Third Birthday, all three of which have vastly different styles of gameplay associated with them. For this purpose of this submission, though, we are going to be only doing Parasite Eve 1, which was originally released on the PlayStation. We are currently playing this on a PS TV. The aspect ratio on some of the menus before the game is a bit off. That's because I have to do some conversions in order to make it work with my setup. But the game should be in the correct aspect ratio. I'm going to set to fast disk speed. Uh, this considerably speeds up the game. Uh, we set to digital mode. Normally, if you were playing this on the PS2, you would want to toggle between analog and digital mode on your controls so that you could get the best movement and the best menuing possible. You can only choose one or the other, though. Uh, digital is the clear winner. Uh, just gives you very distinct movement, gives you very, very good menuing. All of these good things. Uh, things that are far more important than shaving off a few seconds with uh, better analog angles. So we open up on New York City. It is the day before Christmas, and we play as the rookie detective Eye of Rhea on a date with a scumbag, basically, uh, on their way to the opera. Uh, Aya decided to take this date and go to the opera just as catching her eye, not really thinking about it. Uh, nothing really drew her to this other than just her instincts. But uh, that is how we open up on this particular game. So pretty much one of the few donation incentives that is a possibility for this game uh, is naming the main character. Originally, she's Aya, but you do get the opportunity to name her if you so choose. So we'll be going to this opera with our date for the night. We're going to immediately equip the club. Right now at the start of the game, you have an M84F, which is a handgun, and you have a club. That's right. Aya goes to the opera on a date with her police baton and a handgun. But it's probably a good thing because she uses both over the course of day one. Structure of Parasite Eve, uh, we go over six days. The vast majority of the gameplay happens on day five, as you can kind of see from the splits. Right now we get a little bit of a play. It's basically FF6 right now. So one of the big unique draws of Parasite Eve that you might be able to tell is it's set in a modern day setting, which is something that's very, very uncommon for RPGs, especially of this time. Uh, you travel all around, at the time, modern day New York, and you hit various sites that are actual places in New York of the time. Like, I believe right now we are at Carnegie Hall, I want to say. Uh, but we will be hitting New York Central Park, visiting the Statue of Liberty. Some very, very key locations. The Chrysler Building exists in this game, but we will not be going there. That is mainly a New Game Plus thing. And now we're going to go ahead and get a view... of the uh, Opera House here. So, the game's not fooling anybody with its Opera rendition, but it's trying its best. 
Something that's very interesting about this game, um, it does take a more realistic approach to models, but I don't think they were going for photorealism. At this point, they had the ability to do FF8 style animations and character models, but they did decide to go for something a little bit more stylized. As you can see, absolute chaos starts breaking out as something happens to the lead actress. And uh, you might say that this opera is straight fire. I wouldn't say that, though. What I would comment on is that opera seems to be very popular with these same three models in the crowd. Very popular with middle-aged, balding, gray-haired guy, uh, older woman with a long black dress and gray hair. Very popular among that crowd. But uh, I digress. Very, very iconic opening to this game. Sets the stage immediately of this kind of grim and dark but mysterious game. Knock this chump over and get ready to uh, just bull rush the stage of this pyromancer. So you notice that we switch to the club immediately. Uh, there is a few reasons for that. Uh, right here we're having Eve as she's identifying herself, speaking about how the mitochondria have awakened. Do you guys know that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? Well, if you didn't, you'll learn all about that. So we equip the club because it allows you to get turns faster on your ATV in the upper left. It does more damage per hit than the handgun, although the handgun does more damage in its two shots. But what is important is that the ATB is quicker, and we are conserving ammunition. This fight can be between four and six rounds, it just depends how many crits you get. Critical strikes are dictated by a random chance, but the chance is greater the closer you are. So the first phase is pretty simple enough for the first eve. Uh, just avoid the lasers. Even taking laser hits isn't the biggest thing in the world for this fight. It's mainly just trying to teach you the general mechanics of the game. But by using the club, we saved a substantial amount of ammo. Uh, ammo, not the biggest problem in the super classic version of this run. However, over the past year and a half or two years, there have been extreme changes to the route. Uh, that seem very small on the surface, but they have larger effects on the run as a whole. Um, I revisited this game because I wanted to at some point to try out the new route to try a run with PSTV since I originally did my runs on PS2. But also because I just really wanted to revisit this game and get a better time. Um, I still do want to improve what I have here. But it'll be a good indication of the things that can go wrong in the run, where things can go right and give you a good indication of how the game plays. Uh, I do take quite a few chances because I am trying to PB with this route, and I will kind of mention where I would take some safety precautions as the run continues. So very much proving that this is a Squaresoft RPG. We're gonna run into our next Squaresoft alumni. Say hello to Monster Opera Rat. He's got a tummy ache. Just kidding, it wasn't tummy ache at all. It was actually mitochondria. So we're gonna get this really, really cool FMV. Uh, this game, appropriately grotesque, I would say. Some really, really unique enemy designs. Like it's easy to go monster rat, but kind of super DNA'd out, transforming monster rat, pretty sweet looking. So we still do have our club equip. Uh, this is a one or a two round fight, depending on what happens. Here I actually got a crit, which is rather uncommon. Uh, that makes it a one round fight. Normally it would take two. So we're gonna do a little bit of running around. Right now we need to fetch a key in order to get to the actress's uh, lockers struggling to think of the exact word for it, but basically where uh, actors prepare for their time on the stage. And inside of this place, 
we are going to see the diary of Melissa. Melissa is the lead actress who identified herself as Eve, but it turns out at one point she was Melissa. She mentions how she has been struggling really hard to get this role, and she's visited a doctor, and the doctor prescribes some medication. And she started to get worse and worse in her health as she took the medicine and started to take more and more. And uh, just very odd and off-sounding. We then head to the rehearsal room using a key we found there. And here we are going to run into Melissa, or Eve. And we're going to be engaging in the second boss fight of the game, Eve 2, also seeing the second major transformation. So talking a little bit more about the pedigree of this game, uh, the music is composed by Yoko Shimomura. Variety of games, I don't really need to mention too many, but she has a huge back catalog of games that she's written music for, of varying styles, extremely talented person. Uh, the music in this is more of an ambient take, but still very impactful and punchy where it needs to be. So Eve 2 is a very critical and skill-intensive fight. So what we want to do is run up and attack Eve and hopefully get two attacks to her one. As you can see, we back off to allow her to do her laser attack and then move between the laser. So the key things of note here is if we are too close to her when her turn is up, she can attack us with her hand, which does far more damage and basically isn't going to get dodged. And a big key of this fight is trying not to miss as I did there. But that can be difficult. What you are trying to do is stand in such a way that you are threatening and controlling as much space as possible with your club attack. Because you do need to be relatively close to the boss in order to do it. So this is really a risk reward system where you're trying to cut off her angles, get the best chance you can at getting attacks while also minimizing damage taken. And that was a pretty good fight. Although I missed once, uh, we did get the rest of the hits, and that's a pretty quick fight. Depending on what boss you're fighting, sometimes it's not always necessary to crit. Uh, for example, this Eve, we skip a turn of attacking on one crit, three crits, and five crits. Uh, any additional crits would not actually save us time. So it is... You kind of can hedge your bets based on what you're doing and where the boss is as to how often you will be able to complete uh, fights. Like, I usually schedule Eve 2 for a 3 crit fight, so I'm going to skip 2 turns. So here we're killing the bottom rat, which allows it us to let these guys kind of do what they want to, so they lock themselves in place. A uh, key bit of speed tech for this is to try to end fights as close to wherever you want to go as possible. That way you can quickly transition from screen to screen. In this next fight we're going to be running into the mutant frogs. Uh, mutant frogs are pretty notorious inside of the community. They have a very odd collision box compared to their hitbox. That will oftentimes lead you to taking contact damage with them or missing your club attacks. Uh, that large sweeping tongue attack also can do quite a bit of damage and can be difficult to dodge in certain circumstances. So we're going to be picking up our first gun upgrade, which is going to be in the chest to the left. It's pretty hard to see in this capture, but you'll just have to trust me it's there. After that we're going to see Ghost Baby Aya run off to the side. But uh, we'll learn more about who that is as we continue with the game. Right now we're going to run to the back of these sewers here in our evening dress that is getting covered in poo water. And we're going to pick up a offensive upgrade. If this was an offense plus two, we could immediately continue on to the boss. Since it's an offense plus one and in a marathon route, I'd still probably go to the side here. In the side here, you have a potential medicine, a potential defensive upgrade or range upgrade, and another offense. So we go ahead and use both of those and equip our new gun, the M19, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> a lot of uh, numbers and stuff. We'll just say it's the second handgun. We're going to hit this chest. This chest has a potential for ammo or a medicine. We get the medicine, which is what we want. Uh, medicine is your basic cure item. Uh, this fight, actually, 
was very, very recently we discovered a way to skip this fight, but we're still examining the impact on it in runs and if it's worth skipping. Uh, it has to do with how it changes experience. Uh, it is leading to indications that it might be better to skip by about 20 seconds. Still though, uh, if you get two crits, you can kill these guys in three attacks. If not, you need to use more, which I guess I can talk a little bit about reloading mechanics here in just a moment after I open this door. So you'll notice there I went into my menu to go to the ammo crate and reload my gun. Uh, and there is a reason for that. Uh, here we're going to see Eve running away and transforming a crocodile that's in the sewers. Obviously in New York, there's crocodiles all over the sewers. Just waiting to get their mitochondria awakened. Did I mention it's the powerhouse of the cell? Don't know if I mentioned that enough yet. Anyway, uh, our handgun currently has six rounds in its potential clip, and it shoots three bullets a round. An interesting quirk of the mechanics inside of this game is if your gun ever has zero bullets in clip, it will reload to full with no animation. If you shoot your gun and you need to reload before it's the last shot, then she will take an animation to unload her clip and reload it. So because of this, there were times where we will endeavor to change the amount of bullets that are in our clip to allow us to skip that reload animation. And that's probably most relevant against this crocodile, where I tried to reload in such a way that we wouldn't have to worry about reload animations in either phase of this fight. So this is our electric crocodile. It's basically a Pokemon. And just look at how cute it is. So keys to this fight. Uh, this thing has a widespread kind of energy boomerang attack that it shoots in waves. We're going to move off to the side here and use specific timing and movement to try to avoid the attacks here and then shoot it in the tail. Shooting in the head actually doesn't do anything to it. We get one crit, which I'll touch on in a little bit, but more manipulation of the boss to try and get it to shoot waves in a way that we can dodge them. It is possible for the boss to try and hit a melee attack on this. If it melee attacks us, then it could potentially do about 19 damage, I think. But this is fine. Heading into phase two, we have two attacks that we need to worry about. There is a bull rush where it tries to attack with its little hands, and a flame breath where it will shoot multiple times. So because we didn't uh, run into ammo issues with the previous thing, we won't need to reload at all in this fight. So I mentioned critical attacks. So in this fight, for example, we can crit three times and after that it won't get any faster. In the previous fight, had we crit more than once, we would have actually killed the boss without having a divisible number of three in our clip. And what that means is when we went into the second phase of the fight, we would be having the reload animation as we were fighting the crocodile. So it's actually better not to crit on the first phase of that boss. So immediately, newscasters are on the scene, ready to harass our heroine as she leaves Carnegie Hall. But now, it's time for Black Dad Cop to punch him in the back of the head. This is Daniel. He is our partner, a veteran cop of the force, and former partner of the current police chief, Baker. This is where Aya mentions that she just kind of saw the opera on a whim and decided that the guy who asked her out on a date should take her there. We also notice here that Daniel is able to use his superpower to cause cars to approach the speed of light. Uh, yeah, buildings wouldn't blur like that if you were driving the speed limit. Also, he's just doing that in New York City during kind of maybe not super late at night. At like, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Get a nice little flyby of this PlayStation city. That's pretty much going to do it for day one, as an introduction to Parasite Eve. And we're going to go ahead and move into day two here, which will be kind of the start of the real meat of the game. 
Statue of Liberty right there. You can see the Empire State Building, Chrysler Building. I think that's supposed to be the World Trade Center at the time. So, uh, at the start of day two, we're informed that we're going to have a press conference regarding the events at Carnegie Hall. Uh, Aya is instructed to be there by Baker, who isn't trying to be a jerk, but he's actually trying to protect Aya. Um, he's like, just let me do all the talking. Um, we don't need people causing a panic, and we don't need people to switch your words. But first, go ahead and go to the armory and use this mod permit to kind of get yourself prepared. We're actually going to hit the side room here. Uh, this is an optional detour, but I consider it extremely crucial for safety in the run. It only costs us maybe like 8 to 10 seconds, but picking up that CM vest will give us a defensive increase, and it will give us the auto heal ability. What the auto heal ability is, if you get hit to below 20% of your HP, you will automatically use one of the highest level medicines that you have. Uh, that being said, it does have a downside where if the enemy hits you for more than that amount of life, it could kill you and the vest could never proc. So a big part of this game and learning it is understanding when you are vulnerable to an enemy's attacks, which attacks are dangerous, are you vulnerable to a crit killing you, things of that nature. Uh, that being said, CM Vest is very, very good at reducing the amount of healing you need to do in combat, uh, reducing the amount of turns you might have to waste to healing. It also allows you to play more aggressively. And you can even do things like take contact damage, which in general does less health and damage. And by taking that contact damage, you could get your CM vest a proc instead of uh, potentially dying to a stronger attack. So right now, uh, Baker is just like, hey, Let's outfit our street level detectives with an M16. So now Aya is super strapped with her M16, just a normal American town. We're gonna go to Wayne and store some equipment. We're gonna throw away our N vest and our Kevlar vest. Slight miss menu there, but uh, we're gonna get rid of both of those. And we're gonna throw the theater key, rehearsal key, and mod permit into the box. Uh, mod permits are used to change special attributes on guns, but we aren't going to play around with that too much. Uh, rather, mod permits add slots that you could add special attributes to, but it's irrelevant for the purpose of the speedrun. So here, we are going to meet Daniel's son. And here, Daniel's son is like, hey, me and mom are going to go to a concert at the park in Central Park. Will you join us, dad? And he's like, no, Ben, sorry. He's like, if you, dad, and runs off. That kid is flamed up all in red. So you notice we move a little odd here, kind of like down and right before cutting towards the screen. That's because there is a fair amount of invisible collision inside of this game. So sometimes we might move awkwardly, but that's to avoid invisible collision or to reduce extra movement when the game will auto move us to a location. Now we're going to start getting into the press conference as well. And at the press conference, Baker's like, it's because of her quick thinking and police training that she survived the firestorm at Carnegie Hall. Uh, but then uh, Aya will let slip that Melissa said that mitochondria were revolting, that they were awakening. And uh, this causes a little bit of a stir. Baker's then like, this interview is over. She's like, you had one job, Aya. Not to talk about your mitochondrial bullshit. And then Baker's like, get me pictures of Spider-Man. And you're like, that's not a real thing. And then he picks up this pre-rendered phone in the background and talks into his hand a bit. <laughs> Should be noted that this game features pre-rendered backgrounds, which is a huge thing. Uh, when you're talking about the visual fidelity of games of this era. 
Uh, by having a pre-rendered background, it allows you to allocate more polygons to your active models. Uh, that allows you to have much more detailed models, much better textures on them without increasing load times or sacrificing frame rate. Just a little bit of insight on that one. But for now, uh, we were told that we should probably do a little bit of investigation. So we're going to go to the National History Museum to see Professor Clamp, who is apparently involved in all types of biology and research there. He has a very, very odd lab. But uh, we're going to make our way to the National History Museum, which currently, for the Christmas season, is going to be displaying their dinosaur exhibit. So stick around for more on that later. So speaking a little bit more about optimization, um, a big part of this game is knowing what direction you have to go on any given screen. Uh, you do need to mash through text, but funny enough, this game a lot of times will have an animation associated with its text boxes. Like you see this guy kind of waving his hands. It doesn't matter how fast I mash the text boxes in that case, I need to wait for him to stop moving his hands. So because of that, mashing is important in certain places for your text box, but by and large, it's just more important that you're paying attention and keeping text boxes moving. So a little bit of a faster trigger. By moving towards the stairs, we trigger the uh, talking sequence here where he says that you have to sign in. Uh, not a huge sequence break there, but just speeding up the game a little bit. And then we're going to go in to talk to Professor Clamp. Another big thing is understanding if your triggers for loading doors are flat lines or circles. In this case, for example, I just need to hit a flat line that kind of runs parallel to the way that Daniel was facing. So because of that, I didn't need to cut a diagonal to get to him. I just needed to run straight to that line as quickly as possible. Here we're going to meet Professor Clamp, who has a broken monitor where he's using Photoshop. That's clearly CS3 Photoshop on his computer. Uh, but that computer screen is also flickering and going nuts. Which you might be like, well, that's because there's a camera pointed at it with us. But is it? Because that would imply that we are somehow a camera and not actual observers. So I'm pretty sure that his monitor is actually just broken. Uh, anyway, Aya has a flashback where she kind of remembers Clamp from her childhood inside of a hospital, which we'll learn about later. Now we're getting a fairly significant exposition dump where Clamp talks about mitochondria and their impact on cell energy production and reproduction and all that good stuff. And how humans are garbage and we should bow down to our mitochondria overlords, basically. I think Clamp might be evil. He does basically look like a low-rent Hojo from FF7. But uh, regardless, we're going to go ahead and make our way back to the police station and get a briefing on some new information uh, regarding a sighting of Melissa, or shall I say Eve. So I spoke about understanding where you need to go at any given time being a big part of this game. An example of that is easily in this area I could even talk about it. It is actually possible to take about two to three steps into a screen before it fully visually loads. So because of that, it's important to know which direction you need to hold before a screen even visually loads. Uh, this amounts to about a second to a second and a half on every single screen that you're saving. So huge time saves just remembering what screen is coming up and how you are supposed to move to get around that screen. So here we're learning that Eve was sighted at Central Park and Daniel's like, oh no, Ben and Lorraine are there. Uh, Lorraine being his ex-wife. 
So he goes to rush to save Ben. He's like, screw you, Baker. I'm going. And then Baker's like, here's a mod permit, I guess. Which then, after this talk, we will immediately throw in the trash. Because as mentioned, we do not need mod permits. We're going to do a little bit of menuing here. Uh, this is not the smoothest menu I've ever done, but it'll work. We're going to go and throw away the mod permit. We are then going to go ahead and use a tool to modify our M16. I'll discuss that a little bit soon enough. We're then going to equip the CMVS and the M16 and get out of here. We're then going to make our way over to Central Park, where we are going to try and discover what has happened there. So talking about the upgrade system in this game, uh, you have level ups and you have guns. Uh, your guns are upgraded in a couple different ways. There's mod permits to add ability slots and there's tools to modify your guns. Uh, what a tool does is it can rip the bonus parameters off of a weapon or a special ability and it will destroy that gun but move it onto a new one. So in the case of the gun that we just had, we took the bonus points that we had to offense and bullets from the previous day from the handgun, ripped those out, and put them on the M16. Uh, later on, we will be ripping other attributes onto other guns. But you can only do one or the other. You can rip the bonus points, or you can rip the abilities. The vast majority of the time, you're ripping bonus points. But there are exceptions. Uh, upgrading your gun well is extremely critical for the base game in general. Uh, one of the few ways that you can get put into a rough situation is building a poor gun or switching your guns too often. So we've tried to streamline guns as much as possible inside of this run. Uh, of note, some of the there are even different uh, attributes to the guns themselves. For example, handguns will shoot faster than rifles. They will also reload faster than rifles, but rifles will typically have a much higher range and a much higher ammo count that they can keep inside of their clips. Machine guns tend to have less range, but they shoot much faster. They reload much faster. And many of these guns will have different parameters in general. Like machine guns tend to shoot a lot. That means they run through ammo, but they also tend to have a feature called random. Um, just various things that can happen with the attributes in this game. Uh, these snakes are killable. The first snake, the small one, is killable with two shots. This one's killable in one round with a crit, like I just got there. Um, really, we want medicine to drop in the early encounters inside of this game. Uh, that'll stabilize our fights going forward. Day 2 is a heavy reset point for the speedrun, uh, mainly due to the boss encounter at the end of it. Whenever I hear the Central Park music or this kind of ambient theme, for some reason I just immediately think like Lethal Weapon or uh, I think it's called like 48 Hours or Beverly Hills Cop. So these are the birds. Uh, the only word with these birds is that they actually literally drop junk and they're huge jerks. Uh, junk we do not want to pick up, so whenever possible we will not pick it up on our post-fight, like this, or we will menu it out of our inventory when possible. Uh, junk is used to turn into Wayne. If you get 200 junk, you can make a very, very powerful gun, but we will not get anywhere remotely close to 200 junk in this run. It's because that is a strict liability. I'm going to pick up the zoo key here, which we're going to use a little bit later. We take this route through the middle of this kind of courtyard in order to avoid a fight that's in the top part of the map here. We're going to be opening up this chest. Uh, this chest has an 80% chance to get a tool, which we get here. 20% of the time it's an ammo. Uh, if we had gotten ammo, we would be taking a slightly different route in the park to pick up an extra tool. We're now going to see um, mutated apes here. Uh, they can throw their sick boomerang arm. So ammo, not as big of a consideration in the classical run, but since we have changed the way we build our character from the original route, ammo is a little bit of a consideration. And so because of that, we have routed in some ammo chest pickups, including the one to the left in this screen. 
So you might wonder why I'm taking a little bit to menu in that screen. It's partially because I don't want to pick up the jump, but also partially I'm checking to see if medicine dropped inside of the fight. If medicine drops inside of the fight, then we can potentially pick it up and just menu out the junk later because again, having medicine is very critical. So we reloaded our gun manually there to make sure that we didn't get a reload animation. Um, not super critical for this fight, but just kind of nice. Uh, at this point, we can kill birds in two shots. Uh, later on, we will have the potential to kill them in one, but that won't be for some time. So talking about level ups, uh, level ups increase your stats kind of across the board. They also potentially get you access to parasite energy powers or PE. PE is your magic point or MP analog inside of this game. But it's a very, very interesting system. Uh, one of the reasons why I think this is one of the, or sorry, the reason I think that this is the best aged PSX era RPG has to do with a lot of things. Keep in mind that I didn't say it's the best PSX RPG, but I think it's the best aged. Um, it has a very, very reasonable runtime. The story gets going relatively quick. It uses an extremely unique combat system. There's a lot of interesting things that you can do with the weapon system for customization. Um, also, bonus point allocation, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, modern theme, or a modern setting is a big thing. Uh, and you also get this horror, sci-fi aesthetic that you don't really get in a lot of RPGs, especially of the time as mentioned. Here we confront Eve, who has bewitched the crown of Central Park. And is now going to turn them all into goop. Um, it was mentioned by Professor Clamp that mitochondria can produce enough energy and heat to literally liquefy humans. And that's kind of what's happening here. So I is going to chase backstage to be able to confront Eve. This very much is one of those games where they take a concept in science and kind of ratchet up to 11, you know. Like, they'll be like, you know, ants can lift, you know, several hundred times their body weight. And then they'll be like, giant eight, her giant ant lifts a skyscraper or something. You know, something that would never be able to be possible. But like, they're, they're taking the science and kind of twisting it to their design concept. So once again, kind of running seemingly away from Eve. But again, the zone trigger is straight down those stairs. We're now going to follow this ghost baby Aya around the park in order to find Eve. We're going to be making a couple of slight detours here. In the next screen, we're going to be going up onto the gazebo in order to get a revive. A revive is an item where when Aya reaches zero HP or dies, she will revive with a fairly low amount of health. Uh, this gives you a second chance to potentially save a fight or heal yourself up before a boss can kill you. That being said, there are some limitations to it. Uh, we're now going to follow the child. Had we actually run into ammo in the chest instead of a tool at the beginning of Central Park, we'd actually be going to the left and taking um, a different path to pick up an extra tool. But since we did, we don't have to. So speaking about a couple other things, um, I mentioned the unique battle system. As you can see, it is a active battle system, uh, but it is turn-based. Like you do have an ATB gauge that fills up instead of the enemies. You also get a few elements of kind of like light bullet hell where you have to dodge enemies and enemies do widespread attacks if they're bosses that you need to dodge and anticipate and plan for. Kind of a large fight with some birds here. Another big part of this is the parasite energy system. Uh, Parasite Energy, as mentioned, is your MP analog in this game. allows you to cast spells. And the way PE works is it will take a certain amount of PE to cast spells. And that's a certain percentage of your gauge at the bottom right in the case of this screen. Uh, Parasite Energy recovers over time in battle only. 
So this makes it so that you can't really scum out enemies by waiting for your MP to come back. You have to fight to get it back. So if you did want to do something like scum it out, you would have to prolong the length of a fight with like a single guy like this and then refill your gauge so that you could heal up later. Uh, because of this, budgeting your parasite energy is very important to the speedrun. So you have this very active battling system. You have a modern setting. You have this kind of attack sphere grid thing that you can... Uh, as a battle system for shooting your gun and deciding if enemies are in range. You have this very unique and versatile magic system inside of the game. Just a lot of really, really cool concepts that haven't really been revisited that well. Uh, the sphere attack system was somewhat revisited inside of Vagrant Story, but not nearly the same thing. Even the sequels to this game would change the system drastically. A YouTuber, Derek Alexander, who at the time was going by Happy Video Game Nerd, uh, now stops skeletons from fighting, did a series retrospective for this game where he said, if Parasite Eve was Squaresoft saying, let's make a game like Resident Evil, Parasite Eve 2 was Squaresoft going, let's make Resident Evil. <laughs> and that's very clear when you take a look at the pedigree of uh, Parasite Eve 2. It very, or it much more closely follows the survival horror format and uh, conventions than this game does. So as we go underneath this archway, uh, we're going to open up a chest. This chest has the potential to have a tool. If we get the tool in here, we can skip a tool later on and save about 10 seconds. If not, we get a defensive upgrade. Uh, in this case, we got defense one, so totally fine. We're going to be making our way to the final battle before the second and probably second hardest boss in the game, Worms. Uh, in this fight, it is possible that if we crit on a bird, we can kill it in one shot, so you'll see me try to exploit that as we continue on. So Worms is a very, very dangerous fight, and I'll try to cover as many things as I can during the fight, but there's a lot to kind of... You just kind of got to know the fight, if it makes sense. Uh, we will be trying to heal up to full, because as much HP as we can is very integral for this fight. We're also going to be reloading our gun up to 16 ammo. By reloading to 16, we will allow ourselves to guarantee that we will not reload with an animation. Uh, our current ammo count is 17, so we have to manually load up to 16 in order to make this work. So this is all about cycles and phases and attempting to dodge enemy attacks. This is very bullet hell in this. So right now we're going to attack the center worm and the right worm. We are going to try to attack them in such a way that we kill both of them off while minimizing the risk of getting hit. That shot that just passed around me, that is completely consistent. That seems super dangerous, but it's actually not. Now after that is where we have to kind of like move around and adapt. Um, there are certain positions that you can take that minimize the risk of getting hit, but it's not always a foregone conclusion that you will dodge. Uh, there's a lot of damage that gets put out in this fight, and you don't have a lot of health to play with. So this really, normally inside of the game, is a battle of a huge amount of attrition. I only shoot one bullet there because I was pretty sure that was going to kill. The second one crit, so I actually got lucky and killed him off relatively quickly. By killing these two, we increase the size of the other worms, which gives them more HP. Uh, there is a potential strat where you could kill worms more simultaneously than I'm doing here, which is a faster fight, but super not marathon safe. Uh, so now we are going to take turns DPSing these guys one after the other. After two rounds of attacking each of them, we are going to attempt to attack them one after the other. The goal here is to attempt to kill them both at the same time, if we can. Uh, if we cannot, then by dealing damage to both of them, when the super boss worm spawns, he will have considerably less health than he would normally have. And that is very important for finishing this fight off, because if the large worm spawns, you have about one or two attacks that you can do before he is going to kill you. Uh, he does between 55 and 61 damage uh, every single one of his attacks, and there's not really anything you can do to dodge it in a time-efficient manner. 
So we're just kind of very carefully DPSing these guys, taking our time, trying to do what we can here. And as you can see, like, even with how well I've been dodging, this is still a pretty strict fight on your health. Um, another thing that can go bad inside of this fight is if these worms decided not to shoot and instead decided to melee me, they can do a lot of damage, get off cycle because they go back in the ground faster and a number of other things. So that actually went fantastically well uh, for this style of strat. Um, as mentioned, you could take a different strategy that tries to kill multiple of them at the same time, but again, I just do not see it as a marathon safe strat, and I haven't worked out the backups for it if you fail the initial setup. So after that fight, we're going to go into a fight with Eve. You saw me take some time out in order to heal. Uh, that will be integral to tanking damage in the next fight. So... Aya decides to get on this carriage. I assume that she's bewitched by Eve, and that's why she gets on. Uh, this horse is a champ. He is going to run for about two minutes while on fire, and just be fine with that. This is a very small arena to dodge in. There's not a lot of room. Uh, but this is a relatively quick fight. Uh, we are going to attempt to stay close to Eve in the beginning. By staying close to Eve, she has a higher chance of meleeing us. And if she melees us, then we are able to continue to shoot her. Uh, her other attack we will see in a little bit inside of this. But for right now, we're trying to force her to stay down with her melee. There's not really a lot you can do. Sometimes you can get a dodge on the melee, but it's not super common. Uh, we back off so that she uses her energy pulse attack. And as you can see, I have a full ATB, but she's not in range to shoot, which is why we want to keep her in her melee attack mode if we can for as long as possible. Um, it is possible that I could tank one more hit from her slap, but she could also crit, and if she crit, I didn't want her to kill me. And at this time, again, I just wanted to get a run together with the new strats and kind of get a feel for how the run had changed. And set up this marathon video. But a pretty good fight there, I would say. We were able to tank two hits uh, in order to get extra damage on her. Uh, worms went relatively well. You're going to see that I'm going to have a time loss at the end of this. But that really has less to do with things going poorly and more to do with just worms being worms. And uh, little bits of menuing that I did a little bit suboptimally with my kind of like de-rusting, if you will. Menuing a big part of this game. And uh, you take time off, the menuing kind of goes downhill, as it does with any game. So here during this scene, uh, we're going to have Aya, who's going to get uh, rescued later on. But for now, we find out that Ben is safe, even if Lorraine is not. And Baker and the mayor are going to issue a citywide evacuation notice on New York, which is going to lead us into day three. So in order to protect Ben, uh, Daniel is going to take Ben to the police station where he's going to hang out there. So for the purposes of making this a more digestible video to watch, uh, I will be breaking it up into a couple of parts. Uh, this first part is going to cover day one through three, and then after that we'll go ahead and do a video covering the next section of the game. I might do two or three videos. I haven't really decided yet. But, uh, right now they're talking about the evacuation notice and mentioning that Aya has kind of gone missing. And uh, Daniel's like, I got to save her. You know, she risked her life to save my son, even though he wasn't in the park. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how that works out. So now Ben is going to get introduced to Shiva Z who's the prized, prized police dog of this department. And obviously nothing will ever bad happen to her. Couldn't possibly happen. I mean, who would hurt a dog? That's 
That's just mean. Look at that PlayStation dog. This is the most PlayStation dog you ever done seen. It's like bark bark, I'm a dog. But uh, yeah, now we're going to see the evacuation scene of the city. I love this taxi just cutting off this guy. It's like, what is he expecting to do? Like, there's... It's like back-to-back -back traffic all the way down the bridge. Like, <laughs> I have successfully moved ten feet forward and now make it impossible for myself or others to pass. And there's our hero of the story. A single ice skate. Abandoned, left to die, but will rise again, much like Kratos. Except Kratos isn't really a hero. This is Maeda. He is a scientist who has traveled from Japan. He is also a black mage. Uh, these police are being racist and trying to keep him from moving down the street, so he just casts fire on him. And uh, he's basically dying now. Uh, the two policemen next to him are trying to cast the water spell and failing terribly. My head is like nothing personnel and moves on. Actually, that was just Eve exerting her powers. Um, she is able to manipulate the mitochondria of other living things, but she hasn't really controlled it yet at this point. At this point, Aya is still in kind of a fever dream where she's remembering this hospital. Bit of a continuity error. Uh, there is Christmas decorations inside of this hospital. Uh, we will later be visiting this hospital, but... <laughs> Uh, it's not supposed to be Christmas when she was there, so, yeah, a bit of a continuity error, but, you know, I'll cut the game some slack. And we are waking inside of an apartment building inside of Soho. So I love how there's just a barrel with a fire in here, despite the fact that they clearly have electricity. I mean, there's a lamp in the back that's on, and there's a TV that's showing Caesar-inducing cartoon shows to Maeda. But there's just this uh, fire <laughs> inside of a barrel. You then learn that Daniel kind of picked her up and uh, ran into Maeda, who was a scientist that had tried to contact them at the police station, but had failed to. And here Maeda talks about how he was a person studying the original mitochondrial Eve incident that happened in Japan. Uh, Parasite Eve, the game, is actually a sequel to a movie that was released in Japan. Uh, the movie's meh. The uh, game is quite a bit better than the movie, as it turns out. But uh, he recounts small bits and pieces from the original story. Uh, these are also based on books written by a microbiologist, I believe. I forget his name at the time, but uh, yeah, kind of loosely based on his story. So here, Aya is talking about how she's reluctant to use her powers and doesn't fully understand what's happening to her or kind of the world around her. So uh, she's kind of distraught. But they leave her to get some rest. A funny little thing that I like to show off at marathons, if you don't progress the chat enough here, when Maeda walks up to this door, he actually just keeps walking against it. <laughs> uh, you actually need to clear that text box in order for him to walk through. Looks kind of goofy. But uh, it's a fun little thing to show off for the marathon. Just showing kind of game design and sometimes you take shortcuts with it and it produces funny effects when the player does something you didn't quite intend. Kind of for experience for this run, uh, I have done another marathon run for this game at RPG Limit Break. I believe it's 2016, I want to say, is when I did my run. Um, run is considerably different now than it was back then. But also they've changed the ending timing for this run, so because of that we've cut out a large amount of time at the end of the run that was kind of just filler. Uh, I will be submitting still a relatively similar time just because of the variance that can happen inside of this run with danger. So we're looking at something like a 3 hour 10 minute, maybe 3 hour 15 minute, I haven't really decided, but uh, one of those two. So we're going to go ahead and pick up this chest that's going to give us uh, 30 ammo to kind of play around with. 
So the main things in Soho, we need to hit the pharmacy, and we also need to hit the gun shop. You have to visit both places in order to progress the story. Uh, at the gun shop, we are going to be getting a gun upgrade, uh, and we're going to be getting a few other items. So at the gun shop, we're going to be picking up the M11. The M11 is our first machine gun that we're going to be using. Uh, machine guns have a very fast rate of fire. Uh, they shoot a lot of bullets, and they have what's called the random property on them. Uh, we really want that accelerated shot speed and the random ability for certain reasons. Uh, there's also various other things inside of here that we're picking up just to upgrade ourselves and to break later and improve our gun as we go. Uh, so I guess I can kind of discuss machine guns a little bit. So this game has a damage proration system on its bullets. So what that means is if I have a gun that has one shot per round, that one shot will do 100% damage. If I have a gun that shoots two shots per round, I do not do 200% damage. I don't do 100% and 100%. The game actually prorates and cuts down the damage, and it'll do 60 and 60. So I'll do 120% damage over the course of a full round. If I had three shots, it would go to 128% overall. So there's a market decrease, and then after that, it drops precipitously, and you never want to be shooting more than that. Uh, an interesting quirk of this is the random mechanic. The random mechanic will make it so that you are unable to decide where you will shoot your gun, like choose your targets, which is kind of its downside. But it will shoot one and a half times the bullets it's supposed to. So if I shot twice around normally with the gun, by having the random property, it will shoot three times instead. An interesting quirk about this is the damage on those extra shots from random will not be prorated. So instead of a two shot turning into a three shot, normally three shots around would do 128% damage, but instead it does the times two proration. So instead of 128, it does 60, 60, and 60 for 180. So that's a lot of kind of math talk, and I really wanted to break that down to kind of give you an idea. But the basic principle is there is damage reduction when you shoot more bullets per turn, and random is a way of cheating that and increasing your overall damage as a whole at the expense of being unable to target specific enemies. So we're going to make our way to the museum. Uh, Maeda has found a sample that he would like to look at, and the only place that these two policemen are aware of to investigate kind of science-y stuff is at the National History Museum at Professor Clamp's office. It's a very odd scene, shall we say. Uh, I will mention that one of the downsides of Parasite Eve is that the beginning of Day 2 and the beginning of Day 3 are pretty large exposition dumps. So because of that, they are a bit slow moving. Uh, that being said, if you can kind of direct commentary, it gives you a chance to really catch up on explaining mechanics to the player and talk about what you're really passionate about with the game, which is what I try to do whenever I have a longer run. So here Maeda is going to use this microscope. Uh, really, this is basically an electron microscope because it can zoom in and see atom or atomic behavior, which is ridiculous. Like this atomic microscope is just sitting on this table inside of a national history museum in the lab of a guy who's doing basic like historical biology experiments. But but whatever, you know, it's, it's video games, right? So here, uh, Maeda is showing what happens when... Um, Eve's abilities, or DNA, basically interacts with those of the normal mitochondria and cell structure inside of humans. Uh, he has introduced this to a bit of his own blood, and we're going to get to see what happens here. Journey to the center of Maeda. See, look at this. Like, this is just... You get multiple camera angles off of this microscope also. This is a magic microscope, for sure. 
So this is the uh, mitochondria attaching themselves to the nucleus and warping its behavior, transforming it. So this is going to kind of pique Aya's interest, and she has kind of wondered constantly what keeps her from being subject to Eve's dominance over the cells of others. Uh, she is not combust into flame inside of the Carnegie Hall incident. She didn't combust into flame entering Central Park, which uh, Daniel was starting to when he even got close. So she's not really sure why she's able to avoid this, and she asks Maeda to run a test based on this using her blood. So the next thing we're going to get to see is what happens when Eve's mitochondria interacts with Aya. And we're going to have some kind of interesting results regarding that. So inside of this uh, cutscene, we are going to learn that Aya's nuclei and mitochondria have found a way to fight off and adapt to repel uh, mitochondrial Eve's influence. And we're not really sure why this is at this point, but that'll get covered a little bit later on in the game going to wrap it up for science time and we are very quickly heading into the action portion of day three getting out of this exposition clamp comes in wonders what the heck is going on and uh he actually sees this interaction between mitochondrial eve and uh aya's cells uh let's just say it piques his interest Definitely feels like from this interaction that Clamp has something to hide. He's extremely aggressive for seemingly no reason. And uh, most definitely seems to be more in the know than he's letting on. But still, he seems to have a very extreme scientific curiosity when it comes to the discovery that Aya's cells can fight off this new threat to humanity. So, uh, as we get into this, Daniel actually notices something. Uh, the Photoshop document that Clamp was working on was actually a spreadsheet that was mentioning multiple people with certain blood types and DNA sequences. And both Ben and Lorraine, his ex-wife and son, are on this list. And he kind of flips his lid. So here we can potentially get Clamp Skip. What Clamp Skip is, is that... So <laughs> it's a one second skip that randomly happens. Uh, Clamp is supposed to come on screen there and turn off his computer. But for some reason, sometimes if you get through it, he will not appear on the screen. It saves about one second. Otherwise, you have to watch the animation of Clamp turning off the computer. We still, to this day, have no idea what causes it. Uh, but we will often joke about how it's the biggest reset point in the run. So for now, we are going to make our way back to the police station and kind of report what we've seen and uh, see what our next move is from our base of operations. Whenever you go into the world map screen to travel, you can actually move the cursor to locations before it visually loads. Once again, just like simple movement. So understanding how to menu to get to your location that you want to go can also save a few seconds here and there. It's all about saving a few seconds and you go like in a normal speed run oh you only save two seconds of screen but you know when two seconds is over the course of 300 screens and every screen is two seconds like it all adds up and all these little intricacies that you add into a run turn what's supposed to be a 10 hour experience into well a three hour run so here, Ben's going to go off, or rather, Daniel's going to go off and kind of investigate the area. 
Uh, Maeda gives you the first of his good luck charms, which is the Hamaya. Uh, these things are completely useless uh, and only take up a inventory slot. Uh, it is clear that the police station is under attack, and we will have to battle some creatures inside of the police station to deal with it. First, though, we are going to make our way over to the armory and check in on Wayne and Torres, who run the armory. We're going to get into our first fight, and we're going to get to see our first use of the random shot and gun. So that time, all three shots shot the transformed dog. That time, one shot the wolf and one shot the crow. So the thing is, is your shots are determined at the very start of your combat turn when you decide to attack. If an enemy is killed... So like in the case of that, you had the dog and the bird. Let's say the game decided I should shoot all three shots at the dog. But the dog died in two shots only. That third shot that didn't shoot the dog is now wasted. It just disappears. So because of that, random has this really huge risk reward factor where, hey, I shot and this guy's really low on health, but potentially all three shots could go on the guy with low health instead of splitting them up to deal damage to another target well. But that's the risk you run. Uh, we're going to pick up a little bit of ammo here. And we dropped off the Hamaya and the Zuki since we aren't going to need those. Uh, this is our first chance to really get random encounters inside of the run. So most of the encounters inside of Parasite Eve are set. Uh, rather, the positions they can occur are set. Uh, the enemy makeup might change, but like by entering certain screens you can guarantee that you're going to get into a fight. Like, for example, I know for a fact that when I go down to try and reach the investigation room, I'm going to get into a fight here. And I will get into a fight coming out of the investigation room. Um, in this case, the two fights that I would get for those two are set. They will have the same composition, but later on there will be times where the composition of enemies can change as well. There I wasn't super convinced that my medicine was good, so I decided to pick up that junk, which I'll have to get rid of later in order to make sure I got an extra medicine. So coming up here, we are going to be making a slight detour to get the CM Vest 2. CM Vest 2 is a defensive upgrade to CM Vest 1. It will also still have the auto heal that uh, we have used at multiple points at this time in order to reduce our healing time. So I mentioned that you have pre-designated areas where you have fights, but the composition might change. There is also what I like to call hot spots, which is when you go through certain areas, there is a chance that an encounter will occur. And that encounter's composition could be good or bad, whatever. Um, you can't really manipulate hot spots. You're just hoping that you don't get those random encounters and you're just kind of hoping for the best. Because of this, running away from battles really doesn't work in Parasite Eve. Because if you ran away on a scheduled fight, a fight that is guaranteed to happen, it would just trigger again. If you ran away from a hotspot fight, the game will always spawn you back before the trigger for the hotspot. So you're basically just rolling the dice again to attempt to get past them again. And if you fail again, then that's extra time that you could have been spending killing the encounter, getting experience, and progressing on. Uh, as it stands, the experience for this isn't extremely tight, but it is critical that you get enough experience at certain points. And if you got incredible luck, it is possible to be in situations where you actually do not have enough experience to complete the ending fights effectively. So you do want a little bit of extra fights, but not many. Um, typically, you also want to get those fights later on in the game when you're much more powerful and can deal with enemies much more effectively. And they give much higher quantities of experience. So here, Ben is chasing Shiva, who he can tell something is wrong with this dog. And it's pretty clear that Eve is manipulating her influence upon Shiva. 
But uh, Ben doesn't know this and just chases after her. We're going to get introduced to spiders here. Uh, spiders have an ability where they will cast web. If the web hits you, it does paralysis, which greatly reduces your ATB uh, fill rate. Makes you move much slower. They then immediately can rush you and attack. And these guys do pretty high damage, to be honest. Especially if they crit. So talking about safety routes, um, if this was a marathon route, I would definitely have taken a save before the first boss and before the worms boss. So in day one and day two. If this was a marathon run, I'd head to the left and make a save before the Shiva boss fight. Uh, even though Shiva boss fight is typically fairly safe, there is the potential that things can go drastically wrong. And uh, you never want to have to redo huge sections of a game in a marathon setting. So safety is a premium. So Baker, being the crack cop that he is, decides to run himself into a corner with no escape. Also doesn't shoot Shiva before she transforms, but lets Doggo transform. He also doesn't decide to, like, I don't know, throw the dog out the window in case he doesn't think the gun would stop it. But yeah, runs into the corner of the room with Ben instead of running out the way he came, and uh, only has four bullets in his gun. Now you might think like, oh, he only has four bullets, what a what a chump. But I mean, he's the chief of police. He's not expecting to see a lot of street crime, so... Yeah, it's not like he'd be packing a lot of clips with him. But regardless, we're going to have to come to the rescue. So critical strikes in this game do one and a half times damage. Uh, this holds true for enemies as well. Uh, enemies have both physical attacks and parasite energy attacks. Like that fireball attack is an energy attack. Uh, you have different types of defense for each of those. So I guess I could talk a little bit about BP or bonus points. When you level up, you get a degree of bonus points based on how many enemies you killed, what you killed, and how many times you've been hit. Uh, if you get 100 bonus points, you can use those to modify certain stats. Like for example, you can add one additional statistic to your gun, like one attack or one extra bullet and clip or one range. Uh, you could also increase your item capacity by one or you could increase your ATB. Classically, we would raise the attack power on guns, but it's come to light over the past year or so that increasing your ATB up to a certain amount is actually more beneficial over the course of the run of the game. So because of that, we will be using bonus points fairly aggressively to raise our active time until basically near the end of disc one. So this was probably one of the biggest issues. I mentioned how the Shiva fight can go bad. There's two ways it can go bad. Number one, you could get a bunch of bite attacks, especially ones that crit you, and Shiva could kill you. Uh, this is the other way that it can go bad. Uh, this fight was probably the worst Shiva fight I've ever had that didn't involve me dying. Uh, Shiva has four abilities. It has a bite like that, it has a beam that you saw shooting. It has a yell attack that will reduce your health by 50%, but can't kill you. It'll just reduce it by 50. And she has what you're going to see coming up here, which is a heal. So here I body bump Shiva since I have low health to get the CM Vesta proc. At this point, I'm at a low enough health that attacks that she could do could potentially kill me. So I actually try to body bump to get a heal. That doesn't work. So I have to scramble quickly, and my decision-making was to heal two here, which was a pretty decent shot. Uh, unfortunately, Shiva did her last ability, which is heal, which she did again. And she's going to do again. This is how you lose a ton of time on Shiva. Uh, Shiva's heal heals for 100, and especially since we're reducing the amount of damage on our gun with the new build for ATB, she is basically removing these turns that I'm spending shooting her. Uh, she ends up healing, I believe, five times in this fight. Uh, that is a direct loss of about 32 seconds or so. 
and then including the extra round I had to take to heal myself uh, and the decision making involved in with that, I lost probably about 40 seconds, maybe even a little bit more on this one fight. So yeah, you're going to see a pretty big red split on this, but that's not really something that was particularly in my control. I just got a relatively bad pattern. Actually, not a relatively bad pattern, quite a bad pattern. But at least I survived. And sometimes that's uh, the most important thing. So here we're going to find Baker injured. Um, he is going to go off of, off, off of active duty for the rest of the game. And uh, Daniel is going to go ahead and fill in uh, in his stead. So we've learned that Eve is no longer afraid to even attack at the police station. And fully put New York under her reign of terror. So we're going to go ahead and finish up with day three here. I'm going to go ahead and cut this video. And we will be back with a continuation of this starting from day four. See you guys in just a bit.